Good afternoon and welcome to the City of Toronto's COVID-19 media briefing for Monday, January the 11th, 2021. Joining us today is Mayor John Tory, Toronto's Medical Officer of Health, Dr. Eileen Devilla, and Toronto Fire Chief and General Manager of the Office of Emergency Management, Matthew Pegg. Mayor Tory. Well, Brad, thank you and good afternoon. I remain deeply concerned about the increasing number of COVID-19 cases in the city, and you'll hear more about this from Dr. Davila today and across the province for that matter, and I know that the vast majority of Torontonians and Ontarians share that concern. Most concerning of all is the growing number of people in hospital and the frightening impact that can have on the system's ability to treat COVID patients and to also at the same time uh, treat those uh, who are non-COVID patients with their other healthcare conditions. I believe, based on what I have been told, that the healthcare system's ability to do both, and it is important it should be able to do both, is in serious jeopardy. Like many other jurisdictions around the world, we are in a battle, once again, to stop the increased spread of the virus and to protect our healthcare system from being overwhelmed in this manner. Over the weekend, I spoke to Premier Ford and let him know that I will support measures the province can take based on the advice of their health professionals and ours to further reduce the opportunities for the virus to spread and to ultimately save lives. I will say I also expressed my own view as a mayor as to the urgency of acting quickly. The Greater Toronto and Hamilton Area Mayors and Chairs met today and voiced their support for additional measures and for quick action. The time to act is now. And no matter what the province ultimately implements, it is important for all of us right now to exercise our own personal responsibility and stay home as much as possible. As has been the case since the spring, the decision to stay home and to only be with those people with whom you live is actually way more important than all of the government rules and policies that we could ever come up with. By limiting your own in-person interactions, you are helping reduce your own risk of becoming infected and the risk of bringing the virus into your household or spreading it to other households. And you are helping to protect the healthcare system so that people who need urgent medical attention, COVID or otherwise, can still get it. I'm hopeful that Premier Ford and the people of Ontario together can turn our minds back to the successes of spring 2020 when government and people work together to really lock things down and to take on this virus with results more encouraging than what we see today. We are so close to putting COVID-19 behind us now that the vaccines have arrived and the effort is already underway to immunize our frontline healthcare workers and, and, and long-term care residents. The speed at which the vaccine rollout is happening keeps increasing with more to be done. It is worth repeating who does what when it comes to the COVID-19 vaccines. The Government of Canada is responsible for obtaining the supply of COVID-19 vaccines. The province of Ontario has responsibility for distributing the vaccines and for deciding who gets vaccinated, when and where. The City of Toronto is responsible for supporting the administration of the vaccine in accordance with provincial prioritization and provincial scheduling frameworks as vaccine supply is distributed by the province. I'm pleased to announce today that in response to a request from the province, the city will be opening a large COVID-19 immunization clinic next Monday, quite a few weeks earlier than originally planned. This is good news, and I'm glad that the city's immunization task force, led by Chief Pegg and Toronto Public Health, are able to open this clinic at the Metro Toronto Convention Centre early. This will be the first clinic program in the city of its kind. This program will allow all of us to refine the immunization clinic concept so that we make sure we get it right in all the clinics we will have in operation across the city when vaccine is available for the general public. The task of making vaccinations available to 3 million people requires initial steps forward like this. This site will be focused on vaccinating people designated by the province as next in line for the vaccine including frontline healthcare workers in our shelter system and public health workers who will work themselves as COVID-19 immunizers. Chief Pegg will provide further details, but I cannot stress enough the immense amount of work underway within your city government to help the province roll out the vaccine. Hours after getting this request to open this particular clinic, Chief Pegg had us all on a conference call on New Year's Day, planning how we could get this site up and running as early as possible. 
I know that we're all tired of video meetings, but believe you me, there was no better way to start 2021 than with an urgent call about how we could help speed up vaccine rollout to our frontline workers. We are doing everything we can to help the province in particular, because we know that we need as many people vaccinated as possible and as quickly as possible. The Metro Toronto Convention Centre site that opens a week from today is a huge step forward and will give us on-the-ground experience, the kind of on-the-ground experience we need to finish planning details around the rest of the immunization sites. I want to thank Chief Pegg, the task force that he led, the Toronto Public Health staff, uh, the whole team for all the work that has been done so far and of course for the huge amount of work that still lies ahead. I also want to thank the province, including Premier Ford and Minister Elliott and General Hillier, along with all of our local hospitals, because we've all worked well together to move the immunization of all long-term care residents forward and to move this immunization clinic site forward again much earlier, months earlier than originally planned. As of today, vaccinations have been given to residents and staff in all 10 of the city's owned and operated long-term care residences, and we are now working with hospitals to assist the province with vaccinations in the other 77 long-term care homes, again, that being done at the request of the province. That's what people expect all of their governments and government-related agencies to do right now, to work together to get results and to get this vaccine out uh, to our frontline people and then uh, to everyone else in the public as quickly as we possibly can. This immunization site demonstrates that, that this, work, this work is now well underway. It is going at what we would call wartime speed and it should give us all motivation to hunker down and keep following the public health advice until we're all vaccinated. It's now uh, a time to uh, invite Dr. Davila to offer her report for today. Thank you, Mayor Tory, and good afternoon. Today, I am reporting 978 new cases of COVID-19. 433 people are in hospital, and 115 people are in ICU. I'm sorry to have to tell you that we're reporting 14 deaths. This will end, but we're not there yet. At some point, almost every doctor has to look their patient in the eye and deliver bad news. There's a lot of advice on how to talk to people in these circumstances, about the kinds of words to use, and the kinds of words to avoid. A rule of thumb is not to say anything that might seem to shame or blame. At this point, we're past shame and blame. We have some hard truths to face. Our data shows us that as we discussed at the last briefing, COVID-19 is now spreading at levels so serious that it's hard to describe. What we're seeing now is the consequence of too many people spending too much time together in December and in particular during the holidays. You may get COVID-19 and survive. Most people do. But you may spread to someone who can't and it is not fair that someone should die from COVID-19 because the rest of us didn't try hard enough to avoid it. These are hard times for people. It's hard emotionally and it's hard mentally. It's hard when your school is a computer. It's hard to live with the limitations of lockdown and still see case counts going up. The measures are meant to help people keep apart, but they aren't magic. Measures only work when people work within them. The case counts we're seeing show we're spending too much time together in the wrong environments, and the virus leaps at the chance to spread when we do. Many people need to be out moving around. Many people need to work in person. Many people have to get to work 
and many people simply cannot stay at home. But every one of us, with the luxury of making a choice, whether it's once a day or a hundred times, we need now to make the choice to stay home. I get the sense that part of people's frustration is the feeling that no matter what we do, COVID-19 is always able to outsmart us. I understand why people feel that way. It's hard to remember. We have never been closer to that day where we have the upper hand and the virus doesn't. But the price we will pay if we just wait it out, I cannot believe that it is a price that any of us in Toronto would want to pay. Since this started, 2,064 people have died. 71,078 people have been sickened, many of them terribly so. Yet compared to many places in the world, we've done comparatively well, even though we've paid a heavy price. We all know of other places that have paid one far heavier. We don't want to be one of them, but I am afraid that we're at the point, we're at the risk of losing the relative shelter we've enjoyed. To avoid making the risk worse, we have got to get committed at the individual level. Here are the things that you can do. They will sound familiar. You've heard me say them before. And I say them because they work. Stay home as absolutely much as you can. And don't spend time indoors with people you don't live with. If you can work from home, please do it. Get outside. One way to challenge the stress of the same four walls and the same familiar faces is to get out. But wear your mask and keep a distance from others as best you can. It isn't a big risk to pass a stranger on the street. It gets riskier to spend time too close to someone for too long, because then it's easy to let your guard down. Only go out for the essentials. Work that cannot be done at home, groceries, pharmacy, medical care, and exercise. Minimize the amount you're going out. If you can buy online, please do that. Plan ahead so you're going to the store or any store only as often as need be. Try to go out when wherever it is that you're going is less busy. If you can pick up things for someone when you go to the store or when you order online, please do that. Facilitating a distance drop-off is a contribution to keeping apart. I want to stop for a second here to thank all the employers who are trying so hard to create safe workplaces and safe conditions for their customers. I know it's easy to focus on people who aren't doing the hard work, but the vast majority of people I know are putting people first, trying their best to figure out how to make this work and keep people safe. I thank you for that and encourage you to keep making your expectations clear in terms of infection prevention and control measures, in terms of st telling staff to stay home when they're sick, and supporting them when they do, and encouraging them to get tested. How we help one another is a big part of creating a sense of momentum as we live through this very difficult phase of the pandemic. So please, think about the people you know who are alone and check in on the phone or on the computer. They'll benefit from the contact, and so will you. Good deeds work wonders. We're lucky to have so many ways to do them, 
and still be able to keep the distance that we must. This virus keeps spreading because we keep creating opportunities to let it. It's not inevitable that COVID-19 has to spread like this. I understand if you find it hard to believe you have the power to stop the spread, but you do. It just takes all of us doing our best. We may not eliminate it, but we can make it better than this. We can turn this around, and I guarantee you, every little thing that every one of us does is going to be far better than the situation we're in today. I'll now hand it over to Chief Pegg to deliver his remarks for today. Thank you, Dr. Davila, and good afternoon. The delivery of a successful COVID-19 immunization campaign requires the well-coordinated work of all three levels of government. The Government of Canada is responsible for approving, procuring, and distributing COVID-19 vaccine to the province of Ontario. The province of Ontario is responsible for receiving approved vaccines from the Government of Canada, establishing the vaccine distribution priorities, and distributing the vaccines across the province. Once the City of Toronto is provided with COVID-19 vaccine by the province of Ontario, we are responsible for administering, administering these vaccines in accordance with the prioritization framework developed by the province. The City of Toronto created its immunization task force in November and immediately began planning for the eventual launch of COVID-19 immunization clinics in Toronto. Our immunization task force continues to be hard at work, ensuring that the City of Toronto is ready to launch COVID-19 immunization clinics as soon as vaccines are made available to us. The province of Ontario both created the vaccine distribution framework and requested that Toronto be prepared to open and operate immunization clinics to support the overall vaccination effort. These clinics are planned to operate between the point where hospitals begin to immunize high-risk populations, which is ongoing now, and the point at which vaccines become readily available to anyone who wishes to receive one by way of primary care physicians and pharmacies. Delivering these vaccines is a top priority for the City of Toronto, and we are working every day to ensure that we are ready to go the moment that vaccine is available. The City of Toronto's COVID-19 immunization plan includes the establishment and operation of multiple immunization clinic sites, which will be located strategically around the city. This network of clinics will include the use of large public facilities, which we are finalizing now, as well as a number of city-operated facilities, including community centres. In addition to the network of immunization clinics that will be operated by the City of Toronto, our immunization plan also includes the provision of both mobile clinic capabilities and priority neighbourhood response teams. These mobile clinics and neighbourhood response teams will enhance our ability to meet the needs of every resident in every community in our city. Developing, launching and operating an immunization campaign of this scope and magnitude is a massive undertaking. We are actively putting the plans in place to ensure that we are ready to go. This includes numerous facility and logistics plans, staffing plans, security and safety plans, and all of the operating procedures and medical oversight that are required. The development of these plans builds on the expertise and experience of both our Toronto Public Health team and our hospital partners, who have deep experience in operating significant immunization operations. The province asked that we be ready to launch our network of immunization clinics by April 1st. However, the province has also been clear that these dates remain fluid and largely dependent on the availability of vaccine. As such, the city will be ready in the event that vaccines are made available to Toronto earlier than presently expected, which is why we are putting our plans and provisions in place well in advance of the estimated date of April 1. 
in order to ensure that we are able to efficiently and effectively operate COVID-19 immunization clinics in non-hospital settings, we must also ensure that there is a robust, tested and validated plan in place to support this effort. As indicated by Mayor Tory, we have been asked by the province to accelerate the launch of one clinic in a non-hospital setting with a sample group of healthcare workers. In response to this request, and in collaboration with the province of Ontario, we will be opening the first COVID-19 immunization clinic on Monday, January 18th at Metro Toronto Convention Centre, located at 255 Front Street West. This immunization clinic is planned to operate from 11 a.m. through 8 p.m., seven days per week, for a period of at least six weeks. In accordance with the allocation of vaccines by the province of Ontario, we are planning to administer up to 250 first dose COVID-19 vaccinations each day for the first three weeks. Over the course of the following weeks, we will focus on the administration of the second dose of COVID-19 vaccination for that same sample group of people. The group of people who will be included in this initial COVID-19 immunization clinic will be comprised of healthcare workers who work on the front lines of COVID-19 in support of some of our most vulnerable residents. This will include frontline healthcare workers in our shelter system, including harm reduction workers and streets to homes workers. This accelerated immunization clinic is fully scalable and the scope of operations can be increased quickly should the availability of vaccine increase as we move forward. This will enable both the City of Toronto and the Province of Ontario to assess and validate all aspects of out of hospital COVID-19 immunization clinic operations including technology, logistics, and clinic operating procedures. Following the completion of the initial period of clinical operations, we will work with the Province of Ontario on the completion of a comprehensive clinic playbook, which will be available for distribution across the province upon completion. This is critical work that must be completed in order for COVID-19 immunization clinics to be launched, both across Toronto and across the province moving forward. In Toronto, we will be ready to activate the full scope of our COVID-19 immunization clinic operations as soon as vaccine availability permits. I would like to acknowledge and thank each of our team members who continue to work every day to bring our first immunization clinic online and who will then continue on to operate and evaluate this clinic. I am blessed to work alongside such caring and dedicated people who are giving their all to put COVID-19 behind us. I thank each of them for their tireless service. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. And uh, we'll go to questions next. Just a reminder to reporters to please unmute yourself uh, before asking a question. We'll go first to Lucas Meyer from News Talk 1010. Lucas, go ahead, please. Thank you very much, Brad. Uh, Mayor Tory. Uh, you know, based on the comments you made today, and as well as Dr. Villa, who was quite forceful there, I, I certainly recognize many times you've said you don't direct police, and if someone from TPS wants to comment, feel free. Uh, but you have spoken to the levels of satisfaction with enforcement in the past, and I'm wondering, given the numbers we're seeing, uh, the comments from Dr. Villa today, how hospitals are being impacted and ICUs, how we're doing compared to Quebec, if we've reached a point now where there has to be more proactive uh, enforcement uh, with gatherings that are just kind of out in public view. I stand uh, by the view that I've expressed repeatedly, which is that the main responsibility here rests with people, individual people making individual decisions. You know, when you see some of the phone data we've seen in the last number of days showing tens of thousands of people before Christmas having been asked not to travel back and forth uh, between different parts of the region, were going shopping at shopping plazas when Toronto was in a state of lockdown and some of the rest of the region wasn't. You know, you immediately recognize, you know, that that is something that's just not enforceable. If that was a law and you were trying to enforce it, we don't have enough people to do it. And so I think that the enforcement people are using their discretion. I've expressed the view before that I'd like to see a few more tickets written, and even now I still would, because I think some of the people that attend these parties uh, should feel the sting of a $750 or $800 ticket for having, you know, if, if nothing else, the ignorance uh, to go to something like that when they know, I'm sure they know, that they're not supposed to. 
But in the end, uh, you can have all the rules you want. You can have all the enforcement that you want for that matter, and there's only so much we can have given the number of people we have, and police have many other things to be doing. Uh, if people decide they're not going to take their responsibility seriously, and it's a relatively small group, frankly, but they're causing lots of, uh, of heartache and damage, then um, it, it's not uh, enforceable. So um, I just think, again, uh, I, we need to empower people to take their personal responsibility on board um, and do that within the framework of the new uh, tighter restrictions that I hope are coming uh, tomorrow, if not sooner. Uh, uh, now that we know that the province is not going to be putting in a curfew, um, and I know sometimes in the past there's been great matter and, and, and what the state powers are, what the province powers have, but for yourself, Dr. Novella, since we know that the province is not going to have a curfew, um, have you explored the possibility for the city to do it, and would you do it since the province is it? So, Lucas, uh, with respect to what it is that I recommend or what Toronto Public Health recommends, uh, you'll recall that it always has to be informed by the best available evidence that's out there. And when it comes to the issue of curfew, actually the evidence isn't particularly strong one way or another. Uh, in fact, there isn't much uh, to support um, the implementation of curfews. There is, however, a great deal of evidence that focuses on distance, distance, and distance. The more we are able to keep apart, um, while still connecting, making sure that people aren't isolated uh, socially, feeling that they're supported, but the more we are actually able to keep apart and keep our distance, particularly from people that we don't live with, the better off we are in terms of our ability to control the spread of COVID-19. Uh, this is the experience all over the world, and in fact, it's our own experience here. It is exactly what we saw in the spring. It's what uh, brought us uh, to, um, you know, the success, the relative success that we enjoyed in the spring, and it's something that we know we can do. So again, I would encourage all residents of Toronto to please do their very, very best to maintain their distance as much as possible, because it is, in fact, uh, what makes the distinction. And for those who have the opportunity, employers and organizations, where they can support individuals' abilities to do the right thing, to stay home from work when they're sick, to get testing when they're symptomatic, to the extent that that can be supported by businesses, employers and organizations, I would encourage those businesses to do that, those employers to do that, those organizations to do that, so that we can all work together to better control COVID-19. Thank you. We'll go next to Matt Bingley from Global News. Matt, go ahead, please. Hi, good afternoon. Uh, Dr. Davila, um, many have pointed out that the number of, of actual measures that can be taken by a government is, is kind of running dry when it comes to what the province can actually do tomorrow. What, what else would you actually like to see them do if, if, if you know, you mentioned about distance, that that's incumbent on people to actually follow the rules, but what else would you actually like to see them do to, to make an actual difference here? Uh, you know, Matt, as I mentioned in, in my earlier response to Lucas, uh, we have seen the ability to have some success in reducing the likelihood that people come into contact with each other. So, you know, the simple answer is this. I think we, we together as individuals and government, we need to do as much as is possible and we need to do it as soon as possible. But I would also say this, Matt, it's not just about restrictions, it's not just about limitations. It is indeed about individual choices, but it's also about the supports that we can put in place so that people are facilitated in their ability to make choices to do the right thing, to protect their own health and to protect the health of those around them. So whether we're talking about things like sick leave provisions and income supports so that people can refrain from attending work when they're sick or symptomatic, these are the kinds of things that, that I know will make a difference. We've seen them work before. We've seen them work in other jurisdictions, and I know that they will work again. They, they continue to be uh, supported um, by the evidence, and, it, and it's what we've seen work here and work elsewhere. And Matt, I would just like to put a slightly finer point on uh, the comments, because I agree entirely with what Dr. Davila just said. 
If you go back and do a simple comparison, and I hope this is a guidepost that the Premier is using in making his decisions that he'll announce uh, tomorrow, if not sooner, um, and look at what was closed in the spring and what is open and closed today, there are things that were closed in the spring when we had much more encouraging results. Uh, and I, I misspoke myself on television this morning and said that the government rules had closed bank branches down. It actually wasn't government rules, it was the banks themselves in response to a request to generally slow things down and close things down that closed a lot of their branches back then. Well, why shouldn't that be the case today? Why shouldn't we have big box stores closed? I never frankly understood entirely why they were open when other businesses were forced to be closed. Uh, why can't we deal with the hours of operation of some businesses so as to, again, as Dr. Davila said, cut down the number of people who are out active and interacting with each other, including people uh, in and out of various uh, kinds of settings. Uh, they've done a lot of the heavy lifting, and I commend them for this because it's a tough decision that impacts a lot of people negatively with respect to the schools. So I think there are very specific things that can be done if you simply compare the government's behavior, business's behavior, and our behavior in the spring, all of which were different than is the case today, and they need to be much more the same, and you can see it from the phone data that uh, is out there now, and I'm glad there's more and more of it out there. And then one more thing I want to put a fine point on, and this was discussed today by the GTHA mayors and uh, resolved upon uh, unanimously. It is now to the point where, uh, yes, as Dr. Davila said, as many businesses and employers as possible should be offering sick leave protection to workers who need to go get tested and who then in turn, if they test positive, need time off work. But for those who don't have that through their employment and are reluctant to get tested today and in many cases are going to work sick and in some cases are going to work and being encouraged to go to work sick and thereby spreading the virus, it is time for one of these two governments, and I've been in touch with them both about this, to step up, which neither have done, and say it is exclusively the responsibility of whichever government steps forward and says we will make sure those people have a source of livelihood, have a paycheck for the time they're required to isolate and the time they're waiting for their test results so that they won't be afraid to get tested because of losing their paycheck. I am, I'm almost to the hair lighting on fire time with this where the fact there has been no response from anybody about this when we know from our public health people and we know from the facts and figures this is a real source of fear and concern out there. It is just beyond comprehension that no one has come forward and clearly stated yes we will look after you and your families during that period of time. It's a relatively brief period of time and relatively small number of people in the great scheme of things. And so there's a couple of things that have to happen in order to make this situation better. Uh, and, and just to follow up on that, Mayor, um, you, you know, you, you talked to the Premier over the weekend. Did he indicate any reason why either level of government are dragging their feet on this? You've mentioned it repeatedly. You, the, the GTHA mayors have mentioned it repeatedly. Not to sound cynical, but, but what's to really stop them from ignoring one more ask from you? I mean, to be frank, uh, I, I don't want to sort of betray the exact contents of those phone calls I have with both of these levels of government because I, I think I have a relationship of trust with them uh, in pursuing these kinds of issues and many others, including the finances and so on. But I will just tell you that it's my impression they're playing a bit of ping pong uh, with each other. And a ping pong game is always interesting and entertaining, except when it has to do with the health of people uh, who live in our city and who are contracting uh, COVID-19 and who in many cases are the people least able to speak for themselves. And so I, I think what, one of the reasons I sort of put a fine point on saying today one or the other of these governments has to step up and say for the period of this pandemic, and, and again we can deal with the broader policy issue later, but for the period of the, of the pandemic, people who are in a position where they're not covered by their employment to have that sick pay when they're testing positive for COVID-19 are going to be supported so they will get tested and so they can feed their families. I think most people in Ontario and Canada would strongly agree with that as being a top priority of the governments and it's been identified to me by our health people as being important to getting more people tested and, and wrestling this virus to the ground. So let's just get on with it. And I'm an optimistic that will now happen, maybe because myself and the other mayors are speaking even more forcefully about this because it's become more urgent. Thank you. We'll go next to Ali Shiasan from CBC News. Ali, go ahead. Hi there. This is probably a question for Chief Pegg. Toronto's Ambulance Dispatch Centre is dealing with a COVID-19 outbreak. There are 11 positive cases at the call centre and 24 staff members are isolating at home as a result. Could this have an impact on 911 service to the public? 
Hi, Ali. Um, I, I think I'll, I'll start by saying so. Obviously, the operation of emergency dispatch centers in all three of our emergency services are um, critically important essential services and um, form the very front lines of emergency response. Those are the women and men who are answering incoming uh, calls for assistance and who are literally talking to some of our residents and some of our clients, if you will, on, uh, on their very worst day. Having said that, I can tell you um, I'm in regular contact with uh, all three emergency services and in, certainly in this case with Chief McKechn. The Our occupational health and safety teams are fully engaged. Um, there has been no interruption to any of those dispatch services, nor do I anticipate that. Uh, Brad, I believe we have Chief McKechn on the line. Chief uh, McKechn, anything to add to that, please? Yes, thank you. Um, I can also add that uh, we've been able to maintain our service level um, we have a flexible staffing model which allows us to redeploy our staff from various shifts. Um, we also have qualified staff in our education and training uh, unit. And as a, a further fallback, we also have qualified management team members that can step in to fill any staffing gaps. Thank you. Thank you, Chief. I appreciate you coming on the line there. If I can just add a follow-up question again for Chief Pegg. Um, we saw last week paramedics receiving their vaccine and considering they work in tandem with dispatchers who are very much essential workers now dealing with a workplace outbreak. Knowing this, would staff of the call center be good candidates to get their vaccines sooner than later? So Ali, as we've talked about, I uh, actually had included in my remarks and Mayor Tory did as well, the, the determination of the prioritization for the, the administration of vaccines is the responsibility of the province. And uh, there is no doubt, I can tell you from conversations that uh, I have each and every day with General Hillier and his team and that our entire team has, um, the, we would like nothing more, I would like nothing more than to see every single Toronto resident, including all of our, all of our frontline uh, workers and, and everyone else for that matter, get their vaccine. There is, a, there is a prioritization that has been established by the province, and that includes the very specific definition of healthcare workers. So with respect to how that gets expanded and what additional groups of, uh, groups of people, and in this case, in direct response to your question, how that gets expanded and at what point it gets expanded beyond frontline paramedics um, is forthcoming uh, at the direction of the province. So at, uh, at this point, I don't, I don't know when that will happen, um, we will, we will eagerly, eagerly await that decision, which undoubtedly will be timed with the arrival of additional vaccine. Thank you, Chief. We'll go next to Mark Douglas from 680 News. Go ahead, Mark. Thank you, Brad. Uh, to uh, either Dr. Davila or Chief Pegg, this uh, vaccination clinic that's opening up a week from today, why, uh, why is it going at the Toronto, Metro Toronto Convention Centre? It's such a large venue. Are you expecting to need that large uh, that much space to operate this clinic and, and is it going to expand to, to, to fill that, that much uh, square footage? Uh, I'll start and then Dr. Davila can, uh, can jump in after. We, we are leveraging uh, um, existing space provision that we have in the Metro Convention Centre. Our clinic that we described in the remarks today, Mark, will, uh, will operate from what is known as Exhibition or Exhibit Hall A, which is a substantial space. As I've explained, the initial clinic operations that we have been requested by the province to stand up, operate and evaluate um, are intended to give us the opportunity to, in essence, review and validate the proof of concept for out of hospital COVID-19 immunization clinic operations. They are fully scalable and while we anticipate based on the forecasted um, allocation of 250 doses of vaccine per day. So while we know that, or that is the, the planning um, assumption that we're operating under, we are fully scalable. And should the province of Ontario be in a position to make additional vaccines available to us, we can very quickly pivot and expand that scope of operations, taking advantage of what you ac accurately describe as a very substantial space. So I think the only other thing I would add to that is that we've had opportunity to use that space before for immunization clinics. So uh, from a practical perspective, it is a, a natural place to go to. It's a place we're familiar with um, and, and uh, is quite accessible uh, via many routes or, or modes of transportation. So I think there are a number of good reasons over and above what uh, the, the chief described uh, why that place uh, is a good choice. 
said. The one thing, Brad? Yes, of course. Uh, people should remember, and I mentioned this in my own remarks, uh, we, we will have an assignment eventually on a timetable to be set by the province, which is some distance down the road, to vaccinate three million people who live in this city in one order or another uh, and over a relatively short period of time when the vaccine is available. So the notion that there are going to be some large spaces that may well be involved in that as part of the city's planning should come as no surprise because there are going to be three million people and of course the objective here is to get it done as quickly as possible subject to the provincial rules and subject to the supply of vaccine and so within that context there will be large spaces uh, as well as smaller spaces and doctor's offices and pharmacies probably that will be involved in all of that but there will undoubtedly be some large spaces so this shouldn't be a surprise. Sorry Mark, I'm, it's, uh, it's Chief Peg again. I, I neglected to indicate and I think it's important to note when we're designing all of these immunization clinic operations, they are being done uh, with the full concurrence and with full consideration to inf infection prevention and control standards. So there are significant and considerable amount of spaces required in a clinic in order to keep uh, both clients, if you will, safe as well as the, the staff working there safe. So uh, all of that has gone into the logistics and planning and um, hence why this has become a has become and continues to be a very challenging uh, set, of set of circumstances to plan for given that there's a lot of moving parts with a lot of uh, physical distancing that needs to be maintained and a lot of IPAC provisions that we're, we're responsible for providing for and we absolutely will. Thank you very much everyone. That was a wonderfully thorough answer. Thank you. Uh, follow up question to Mayor Tory. I guess not so much a follow up. I'm going to change uh, uh, topics here quite a bit but uh, Mayor Tory, are Toronto police bringing in any enhanced measures, safety measures over the next couple of weeks over possible concerns of local violence or demonstrations related to U.S. President Donald Trump leaving office? I will just say that uh, on all of these kinds of matters, including incidents that happen around the world of different kinds in different countries, uh, that um, I'm in uh, daily communication with uh, Police Chief Raymer and that uh, I trust, uh, first of all, that when there is a concern in that regard, he notifies me, and secondly, that uh, he also, in the course of notifying me, indicates what measures they've decided to undertake to ensure that the people of Toronto are kept safe. Uh, he knows that that's my wish, um, he knows that that's his responsibility, and he carries it out, he and his uh, team of men and women, um, in a way that I think keeps us all safe. And so I know that he will be doing whatever he has to do in respect of any inter event happening internationally or, or within Canada to keep people safe. Hey, thank you. We'll go next to Mark McAllister from City News. Mark. Thank you. I'd like to start with Chief Pegg, if you would. Um, do you have a sense, Chief, how much the medical calls the paramedics and fire are responding to have increased over the last year? Uh, Mark, I don't actually have that data with me at this point, but that is certainly something that we could get, uh, we could obtain and get back to you offline. I appreciate that. Um, and perhaps to you and Chief McKechn as well. And I wouldn't mind Dr. Davila's take if you're all willing to speak to this, but obviously all of the frontline health workers have felt a burden throughout this pandemic, especially now that cases are at the level they're at. What can be done to offer city employees like paramedics and our fire personnel some relief, if anything? Well, Matt, I think you've, you've hit an important issue and I, I, I would suggest to you that uh, your suggestion or your comments that our, our emergency responders have absorbed uh, a significant burden over the course of COVID is accurate. But I will also say it is equally accurate that our entire City of Toronto staff team have absorbed similar, um, similar concerns and similar uh, increases in impacts as have our residents and our, our business uh, our, our businesses throughout the city. With respect to, to emergency services, um, obviously I have, I have nothing but the deepest of respect for the women and men that are serving in police and paramedic services and certainly in fire services and our Office of Emergency Management and the list could go on. Really at this point, um, I wish I had more to offer. To be completely candid, what I wish is that I could snap my fingers and make an unlimited supply of COVID-19 uh, vaccine available to not only emergency services but to everyone in the city. That is what we are working day and night to get towards. That is what General Hillier and his team is working to put us in that place and uh, until that comes um, 
Perhaps the best I can offer right now is a very sincere thank you, an acknowledgement for all of the extra lift under very demanding circumstances, and my word that, uh, that, that myself and the teams that I work with will not stop until this is behind us and until we can all take a rest. So my sincere thanks to all of them. Chief McEachern. Yes, I would just add, Matt was very, um, was very detailed on that support for all staff. Communication is key in these times, and we've been very diligent at providing the most up-to-date information from our public health colleagues uh, regarding COVID-19, and that's very important so staff have relevant information, as well as providing mental health supports. So we've, gone, we've really tried to enhance our level of support on the mental health side for staff with uh, various access points. And, we'll, and finally, we also have been introduced a staff support center that really helps connect our staff with, with our team to make sure that they understand what they need to do or answer any questions they've asked. So that's a really important element in supporting people at this point. Dr. Dole. So Mark, I think my two colleagues have already given you quite a thorough uh, response to your question. I would say this though, uh, Chief Pegg is quite right. Uh, the city has been uh, hard at work uh, for many, many months now in respect of the COVID-19 response. And yes, our colleagues in first response are, are, are perhaps most visible. But I would also say this, uh, the entire team at Toronto Public Health it's almost exclusively dedicated towards the COVID-19 response. And it has been a very, very heavy lift for, that, uh, for the whole team at Toronto Public Health. Uh, so certainly I've said this before and I will continue saying it. I cannot thank the team enough for their incredible efforts, their constant efforts. Uh, it has been a challenge all the way through. COVID-19 is a formidable foe. But no matter what challenge has, has been put in front of us, the team at Toronto Public Health has risen and then surpassed every single one of them. And they do this every single day, although they are absolutely exhausted. They are truly, truly exhausted because they've been at this for, for you know, almost a year now uh, for many of us at Toronto Public Health. So when I think about what kind of relief might be provided, um, you know, recognizing that for the team, it is a true honor and privilege to serve the residents of this city. I think the one ask that we would have is that we would ask the entire city to recommit, to really commit to staying home as much as possible so that we can continue to provide you with the best service, the best public health possible. We need to control the spread of COVID-19. This is something that we need to do together. And I would just ask again that all residents of the city of, the, of Toronto to do the very best they can to stay home, to keep apart, to keep supporting each other as much as possible while keeping that physical distance, uh, but really to limit their social interactions to the greatest extent possible. That's what will see us all through. Okay, thank you. We'll go next to Natalie Johnson from CTV News. Hi, Natalie, go ahead, please. Hi everyone, uh, my first question is for Mayor Tory. Uh, sir, we're nearly a year into this pandemic uh, and certainly we saw this second wave coming, but we've been told for a while now that tougher new provincial measures are coming, that they're still being finalized and discussed. Uh, my question is how is it that we've gone for so many months without a specific plan in place? It feels like officials are almost teasing out potential measures and it almost seems like they're still brainstorming. Well, Natalie, first of all, welcome back. That's uh, important. It's good to have you back uh, asking tough questions like that. Um, and the best I can answer it is to say this. All of us, I think, whether it's Premier Ford, uh, ourselves here, uh, Prime Minister Trudeau, we're dealing with uh, a formidable foe, as Dr. Davila described it, in the COVID-19 virus, but also one which changes uh, where we're learning things. We're learning things that work and don't necessarily work because, again, to remind ourselves, this was only discovered just about a year ago. And so I think that we have, uh, what, the point we're at now is, would be the following. We did actually see some positive and encouraging results when people stayed home and when most everything was closed down in the spring. And so I'm hopeful that the Premier, as he's contemplating what he's going to do, and I wish they moved a little more quickly just right now because I think we have the lessons in hand from the spring of what worked quite well at that time. 
in terms of the degree of close down we have to have to limit the interaction people have with each other and the exposure they give each other to the virus. And I would just hope that we could go back to that lesson that we learned, I think, reasonably successfully and get on with doing that and that we'll have the same level of cooperation we had uh, in the spring. Because I think in the spring it worked as much because the rules were um, more all-encompassing, but also because people at that time, to be honest, might have had a little more fear in them about the unknown. Uh, and today somehow they think maybe they know a lot more about this. Well, we don't. And there's a lot of people in hospital and in ICUs and so on to show for that. We don't have the answer. We have an answer that may lie ahead in the work that's being done with vaccination. So um, I, um, you know, I, I would ask people who have that feeling of impatience to put themselves in the position that all of us collectively are in, which is that we're learning lessons every day. Uh, there is no place in the world where they've had an absolute playbook that says this is what works absolutely positively to wipe this thing out. Because if there was one, I can assure you, in Toronto, we'd have been among the first to adopt it. Um, so we're having to, to learn from other countries and from ourselves as we go and do the best that we can. And I'm hopeful that what's going to be announced, I gather, tomorrow uh, will be effective and, and, and broad-reaching uh, broad in that respect so that we can do what we saw work in the spring. Uh, thank you. And just as a quick follow-up, you mentioned learning what works. Uh, some other jurisdictions have implemented restrictions on how far residents can travel from their homes, uh, assuming, of course, that they aren't essential workers. Would you support a provincial measure that would limit the travel of residents here? Well, it's, it's kind of like a curfew. I mean, it's a, it's, a, it's a sort of a curfew by another name. And, you know, it was interesting because all the mayors from across the GTHA and the chairs of the biggest municipalities got together today. And, you know, they, they agreed that they, including myself, were satisfied with the decision not to uh, put a curfew in place because, in part, of the uh, difficulty in enforcing that, uh, but because... Uh, again, uh, you can have all the government restrictions you want, uh, you know, uh, of any kind, distance uh, from home, time you leave, time you come back, you know, and, and so on. And if people don't decide to follow that um, and to buy into the program, then it won't work. And so I think, again, what we're going to have here is a series of restrictions like we had in the spring, which really limits the number of places you can go simply because they're not open, uh, and then relies on people to say, you know what? We're all, we are all in this together and we have to uh, follow along and not go places that mostly aren't open and not go places we shouldn't be, especially when it comes to these social gatherings. So um, I, I think that I'm sure they're considering all these different kinds of measures, uh, but uh, I think the key will be broadly reaching in terms of what it closes as we did in the spring and then public cooperation as we saw in the spring and that can produce as it did then some very encouraging results. Thank you. Final question now is to Francine Copeland from the Toronto Star. Go ahead, Francine. Oh, uh, good afternoon. My first question is for Chief Pegg. Um, I was reading the report on the, from the uh, vaccination team that's going to the Board of Health uh, uh, later this month, and uh, it mentions that by the end of 2020, um, Toronto had received 50,000 doses of the vaccine and was expecting another 50,000 in early 2021. I'm wondering how many of those 50,000 doses that have been received have been used and whether we've received the second 50,000. Uh, Francine, I will start and then I'm going to go to, to Dr. Davila. Um, really the only context that I, that I can provide, uh, I, don't, I don't have in front of me the breakdown of, of each of those doses, but I will simply start by uh, indicating and reminding that um, those are allocated to us by the province of Ontario and that is uh, based on their ethically informed um, vaccine distribution priority framework. So uh, we are downstream from that and I will, I will ask uh, Dr. Davila if she would like to follow on. Sure. So Francine, I'm afraid I don't have the numbers myself in front of me. I know that certainly uh, a goodly proportion of the doses that were provided uh, through to Toronto have been used. Uh, we are awfully close to, to uh, ensuring that all the long-term care homes here in the city, all long-term care homes in the city, uh, have had at least their first dose and second doses to follow up thereafter. But uh, certainly, Francine, happy to speak with you offline to make sure that you've got the most accurate numbers. Um, okay, and then my, my follow-up question is for um, Mayor Tory or Dr. Devella or both. Um, Speaking, you know, with regards to, to lockdown measures, is there anything that the city or Toronto Public Health can do? Uh, do you have anything left in your arsenal that you could do today or tomorrow um, 
you know, instead of waiting for the province to, to implement more measures? I will start from the standpoint of, of, I'll call it the law and the sort of efficacy of these things, and Dr. Davila can, can address it from her perspective as the Medical Officer of Health. One of the things that I've learned, um, you know, through this pandemic is that if you can have a provincial order where there is little or no question about their uh, legal jurisdiction to bring it in, uh, and, and, and uh, if you can have something that is a consistent either province-wide or even region-wide uh, measure that's undertaken, this is going to be more effective by definition than one where either it applies to part of the region and not all, and, or, or where there's some question as to whether um, the city, for, for example, even has the jurisdiction to do something. And so that I think, uh, yet again, um, we're in a position where it is best uh, for us to wait and see what the province is going to do. We've made our representations uh, without speaking for the doctor, but certainly in my own case, I've said I hope that something is done quickly and I hope that it is done in a broad reaching a fashion to be effective uh, and that we'll see what they do tomorrow and then I guess we'll have a further discussion as we have each time they've acted uh, to say, well, is there something more that we can do? And I think you've seen that when uh, the occasion has arisen where we had the jurisdiction and power to do something, often we have, or, or at least some of the time when we thought that we needed to. So Francine, obviously I'm not a lawyer, so I will defer to the mayor in, in, in matters that relate to the law as that is his training. However, I would say this, uh, as per our experience uh, in the spring and the experiences that we've noted of jurisdictions all around the world, I would strongly encourage that we do as much as possible, uh, recognizing that as the mayor says, that these things are best done at that provincial level and on more at least a regional scope in order to have the greatest effect. But do as much as possible, do it now. It's not just about restrictions, it's about individual choices as well and ensuring that the supports are in place, whether it's at the organizational or business level or at the government level, to support people to make good choices so that we can keep our distance, stay physically apart as much as possible, in, reduce our interactions, right? really keep those interactions down to a minimum, that's what we know will make a difference in terms of reducing the impact that COVID-19 is having on our community right now, and in particular on our healthcare system, until such time as we are able to get enough vaccine uh, to help support uh, the other efforts that we've put into place so far. Thank you very much. Thank you for joining us. That concludes today's briefing. Our next update will be this Wednesday, January 13th at 2 p.m. Stay well.